What I've developed here over the last 30 years um, is now being adopted all over the world. Um, a lot of adoption in, in the US. And now, as far as we can estimate, there's about three million acres uh, that are pasture cropping uh, are now around the world and about 3,000 individual uh, landholders are, are pasture cropping. So there's a big adoption of this. The one thing that most, many people don't realise is that pasture cropping is also perennial cover cropping. There's a big push now, especially in the US, but a, a, a push here also in Australia to grow cover crops. This form of agriculture is actually perennial cover cropping and we can have those perennial grasses here all the time and plant the crops into that cover of, of perennial grasses. There's a big shift now into, for the want of a better word, regenerative agriculture all around the world. Um, and there's been a few of us that have been at it now for probably 30 years and, 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 and been getting a small adoption. That momentum is growing and I think the role of your generation is to really not only continue that, that movement but, but ramp it up because we don't have a lot of time. We need to fix this planet real quick um, because we've just about got it stuffed. Now I'll start with some introductions. My name's Lindsay, uh, this is David and we have Jack in here working on the tech side as well. Um, we're all founders of Smart Soil and uh, Smart Soil is a company focused on building online education uh, resources for, for landholders and farmers and anyone who wants to improve their relationship uh, with, with the earth. So um, that's a small snippet of what we do. The reason we wanted to bring you here today was to, to um, basically interact with Carbon Opportunities, interact with, with Colin. And um, we have a, an online course uh, coming out, which a lot of you would be aware of, um, focusing on the, the technique designed by Colin, which is pasture cropping. Um, here he is here. Hello, mates. Hi. Beautiful. Uh, so Colin's with us now. I'll just give you a little rundown of of how this conversation is going to take place. Uh, first of all, we'll, we'll introduce Colin. Colin's got a, a little presentation which we've just brought up and he, uh, he'll take us through that. That may take around 15 to, to 20 minutes. Uh, following that, we're gonna go through what's involved in the course. So what does the course uh, include? And also what do you as a, as a consumer get out of the course? So, uh, you know, um, practical takeaways and, and what you're going to be then uh, able to apply on, on farm. Uh, and then we're going to do a QA. and a So you're able to, to ask Colin any questions related to your enterprise or, or your own personal experience. Um, we'll try and get through as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, as I said, we have uh, Jack here who's who, uh, passing the questions on to us. What I suggest is that if you have any questions pop into your mind, just write them in there because we'll be logging them and um, we'll be able to circle back uh, and get to them uh, as soon as we can. Good morning, Cole. Good morning. Or afternoon. I hope this, I hope this presentation is working. <laughs> as, as I said earlier, guys, we've, we've had a, a few tech issues and, and we're currently learning to, to utilize the system. So um, please be patient with us. Uh, but we, we do have it working now, which is good. So, Cole, what, what I might do, mate, is, is bring it over to you. You can introduce yourself. There. A lot of people would already know um, who, who you are and what you do, but if you just want to introduce yourself and then you can go ahead, mate, straight into your, your presentation. As, as many of you probably know, I, I farmer, it, uh, I'm fourth generation farmer on, on this farm here, uh, southeastern Australia. Um, I'm not sure where many of the, the um, listeners are, are from but uh, I assume around the world so I'll have to talk about this uh, internationally I guess um, just to, to uh, like I said we've been farming here on fourth generation my great-grandparents settled here on, on this farm in 1868 um, and I'll in this presentation I've got a little bit of information on that as well and also um, how pasture cropping and the way that I farm actually happened uh, and the, the reasons why and, and what got, had gone wrong previously. Um, so without, uh, without saying too much more, I probably should start on the presentation and, and go from there. So 
there's 2,000 acres here on, on, on this property and we're uh, 300 kilometers uh, northwest of Sydney. There's granite soil, so it's not, it's not heavy fertile soil. 600 mil millimeter annual rainfall um, and central tablelands, New South Wales. And that map of Australia there uh, on, on that red dot on it is actually roughly where, where we are. So it gives you a bit of an idea. It's a reasonably, a reasonable rainfall area of Australia. Just to give a, a, a bit of a, a quick rundown on the enterprises that we run here, which will make sense when we start into the course generally, but even this, this little talk I'm doing now. We run 4,000 merino sheep here uh, for wool and meat production. About 500 acres of that 2,000 is, is cropped or all pasture cropped. Um, and uh, generally to um, either, either wheat, oats, cereal, rye, barley, those types of crops. Some cattle, ca cattle um, as well. A big enterprise we have is native grass seed and harvesting, harvesting seed from our native grasslands here. Uh, and, and also we run a, a, a Kelpie star days and a working Kelpie dog start as well. Right, we need to really ask what's gone wrong with the way crops are, are, are growing. And this, I'm talking about conventional cropping, plowing and uh, uh, herbicides. And it's actually been a disaster for a long, long time. And around the world, the way we crop with either, either plowing soil or excessive use of pesticides, certainly has reduced soil carbon levels uh, and that, that influences effective rainfall. So reduced soil, soil fertility means we need to put more fertilizer on, increasing insect attack is, uh, uh, means we, need, we are putting on more insecticide and increasing crop disease, more fungicide. And that method of, of agriculture really isn't working. And also around the world, there, there's 10 ton of soil loss to erosion for every ton of grain produced. We can't continue to do that, that, that type of farming. It just simply isn't working. We need to change. Now, if we look at this, uh, just information for 10,000 years, agriculture started about 10,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. Um, but for 10,000 years, we've killed grasslands and destroyed soil to grow crops and graze animals. So just to sum that up, the way we graze animals isn't working. It kills grasslands or the, 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 the grazing methods, kills grasslands, destroys soil, soil ecosystem and destroys the farm ecosystem. The way crops are growing, grown using plows and excessive pesticides, also kills grasslands, destroys the soil ecosystem and, and also destroys the farm ecosystem. That's just simply the, the way it happens and that seems to be accepted. It can't be accepted. Not if we want a planet to live on because not only destroying our farms, it's doing a lot of damage to our planet as well. So increasing fertilizer and pesticides, which is what's usually recommended uh, in, in, in industrial agriculture, won't fix the problems. The problem is the farm and soil ecosystems are broken. Um, it's, it's an ecological problem that we're dealing with. Uh, so how can we fix them? To answer those questions, um, I, I had to address those questions quite a long time ago, quite a few years ago. So to answer those questions, I'll go through a little bit about why I changed. Um, as I said earlier, my great grandparents settled here in the 18, uh, uh, sorry, in the 18, 1860s. Um, and they started growing wheat in the 1860s and also uh, running, running merino sheep as well. And then in, in the 1930s, industrial agriculture was adopted by my father. He was very innovative. He, he adopted industrial agriculture, in other words, tractors and machinery. Before that, he was, he was uh, using horse teams here, as his, as his father was. So growing wheat was very profitable, but the, the way that he was farming, which was the best practice at that time and recommended, destroyed the farm. Um, and um, 
uh, and, and mostly with erosion and, and degraded soils and, and, and now we know degraded soil carbon levels as well. He attempted to fix those problems and so the, the, the areas down to all introduced annual pastures, which were pastures mostly from the Northern Hemisphere, fertilised the, the pastures, um, ploughing and cultivating to grow crops, and started to use high rates of fertiliser and pesticides. It worked quite well in that era, and that's actually, he was part of that, of the Green Revolution. It worked well in that era. And, and then I adopted those, those methods, and this from Fattis of me in, in the 1970s, uh, killing everything that I could, either with plows and pesticides, even then. So we'd lost our, our, our perennial species here on the property and they were replaced with a, 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 mostly annual pasture species. That method of agriculture was costing us $80,000 annually. Um, and then things started to go wrong in the 1970s and fertiliser cut became too high. I won't go through all of that on there, but we were going broke. Even in the 1970s, well, was in, that was still in my father's era, we couldn't afford all of those inputs, all of that, that fertiliser and pesticides we were putting on was actually sending us broke. So how did I fix those problems? Had a major bushfire, or uh, in, around the world it's often called a wildfire, in 1979. And uh, most of our sheep were killed. 3,000 sheep were, died in that fire. All the buildings were destroyed. And we were, uh, we, we went, we were broke because of that fire. We had no money at all. So because of having no money and few livestock, I decided, decided to grow wheat. Um, and that was done by ploughing, scarifying, cultivating, as my father did, and really did a lot of damage to the soil on, on the farm here. Um, and like my father's era, it eventually failed. Crop disease declining at carbon levels, all of that. So I started to look at, at zero tilling or in, in, in the 1980s. Those days it was actually called direct drilling. But, and there was a lot, lot of herbicides used, three, four applications of Roundup, for example, fertiliser uh, used as well. All that had really done was replace the plough with a boom spray. I hadn't, I hadn't changed the basic philosophy of farming. So, uh, but things started to go wrong with declining yields, crop disease and insect attack. So how did I fix those problems? The, I got good agronomic advice at the time and the advice was to double the fertiliser, um, add urea in crop, add, use fungicides, insecticides, and, and, and more, more herbicides. And, and that same advice has been given today. The advice hasn't changed much, and, and, and that is, um, 30, was 30 years ago. So I didn't accept that advice. It didn't add up financially, and the amount of nitrogen fertiliser that was recommended was toxic to wheat plants. I didn't accept that advice. How did I solve those problems? Well, I changed uh, uh, to look, uh, uh, look at low input agriculture and stop using uh, fertilizer and pesticides and I focus on 100% ground cover. I, I looked at and adopted Alan Savory's holistic plan grazing in 1993, around the same time developed pasture cropping. Pasture cropping, what, what is it? Pasture cropping was developed by myself and Daryl Clough one, one evening, and I won't go into too much detail here, but we, we developed pasture cropping over about 10 or 12 of these Australian bottles of beer. And, um, so, and, and there was no great philosophy in it to start with, but I, I, I guess the beer uh, in, inspired us to think outside the square. So um, Pasture cropping is actually perennial cover cropping. And it is the first time, first change in agriculture really for 10,000 years in that uh, everyone had tried to kill it, 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 even now. We, we're killing everything to plant a crop. What we're doing in pasture cropping is keeping perennial grasses in, in your plant, perennial plants in there while we're growing the crop. Just focusing on looking at Cover cropping, this, this cover cropping is, is, a, is a good method. Cover cropping uses annual plants to create mulch, control weeds and improve soil health. Pasture cropping uses perennial plants to create 
uh, to create mouse control weeds and, and, and improve soil health. So it's perennial, perennial cover cropping. So why would we use these techniques to, uh, to, to grow crops? And why would we change? Well, we do know now there's been lots, a lot of data collected on pasture cropping um, by research organisations in Australia. And we know there's certainly more profit in it. We can restore our grasslands and improve pastures. Conventional agriculture cannot and does not do that. We can grow stock feed, we can grow good grain crops, and we can improve the soil. In other words, restore the soil ecosystem um, and less costs over time. Less fertiliser, less herbicides, less insecticide, less fungicide. And a lot of what I'll be doing in this course is, is, is teaching people how to transition from what they're doing in, in uh, high input industrial agriculture, how to transition to a, to a better way of farming. So if we look at this here, uh, traditional cropping methods, using either ploughing or, or herbicides, um, how, if we ask the questions, how much stock feed is produced in that method and how, how much pasture is destroyed? So how much soil structure is destroyed, soil carbon and soil erosion? And the lot of it, the result is a crop grown in this method, method with this method, we've got destroyed soil, destroyed pasture, and then the need, the, the need to re-sow pasture. It just simply doesn't work. That method of, of growing crops does not work. So by using these methods, we can produce good grain crops for grain or forage. We can get grazing right up to the point of sowing, sowing the crop or planting the crop. And we can restore our perennial pastures or, or our grasslands while we're growing crops. We can improve soil structure, in, uh, soil carbon, improve nutrient cycling. Um, and it restore the farm and soil ecosystems. So it's more than just sowing crop into grass. There's a bit more to it than that. It is perennial cover cropping where we sow it, so we were zero tilling uh, crops into perennial grass or grassland. We're using animals uh, as part of the process of, of sowing the crops. Grazing and cropping are combined and managed in a way where each one benefits the other. We're using zero tilling, as I said, never ever ploughing, never turning soil upside down, never killing perennial species. Um, we, we're managing uh, weeds by creating thick litter uh, on the ground, and also we are uh, can we can uh, use very careful use of selective herbicides, and that's especially when we're first starting and transitioning. Um, so. And the A key to this is the crops are usually grown, grown when the pastures are at, in the dormant stage. And that can be a different all over the world and it can be different with different pasture species or grassland species, which is a really important thing to understand and, and have the knowledge of. I'm just going to take you very quickly through some photos here of, of, of a sequence of pasture cropping. That's a perennial grassland. Remember, this is in February, which is our summer. Um, so then we're harvesting seed off these grasslands, which is a great, uh, great source of income. Sowing, the, uh, grazing those, that area and planting a crop into it, zero tilling it, as, as that slide shows. The emerging crop, um, around uh, just before this photo was taken, that, that crop was grazed, um, leading up to harvest and then harvesting, harvesting the crop. And then you can see the emerging uh, summer grass, warm season grasses emerging from underneath that, that crop. Then we're grazing that, that, uh, up, up that grassland again. Also then we're harvesting native grass seed uh, from these paddocks as, as well. And just the last week we've been harvesting a lot of native grass seed. It probably harvested two tonne of native grass seed this season, um, not possible with, with uh, uh, conventional industrial agriculture. Just a tiny bit on multi-species crop, uh, uh, crops. I looked at, I was looking at multi-species crops. I am rushing through this to try and make sure I uh, don't take too much time up. Um, and I was looking at adding more species to the crop um, to, to, to improve our soils even further. Um, 
Here we're growing some of these multi-species crop oats, forage brassica, vetch, tillage radish, clover, fields, peas, turnips. That mix is varied depending on what you're trying to achieve. And, and, and in the course, we'll be talking a lot about multi-species crops as well and using them to fix different problems we have on our farms. Uh, just another photo. This is pasture crop multi-species. Um, now, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. There's a lot of advantage in these multi-species crops. It does produce far better quality uh, stock feed, great improvements in soil health. We do add, add nitrogen with legumes, good weed control, we can get good insect control, and we can still harvest the cereal crop after grazing. And there, there's some methods we use to do that. Um, which again uh, will be spoken about quite a lot in, in the course, how we can still harvest grain from these multi-species crops. Now, just to sum, sum all this up, now, over a 12-month period, this is what you can achieve. In this 12-month period in, in a paddock, we, we get, can get grazing of that grassland, pre-sowing the crop. Graze the crop, whether the sheep or cattle, we can get grain from the crop. Now, some of these multi-species crops, uh, we can include vegetables. Many of the species we, are, uh, we, have, we, we grow have vegetables in them. So there is potential, I don't do it here, but there is potential to grow vegetables in a grassland. Grazing of the grassland after harvest and then native grass seed. So we can do all that. We've got all that ed those enterprises on, stacked on, on a grassland while we're improving soil structure, soil health and nutrient cycling. Insect control, uh, reduced or no fertiliser, no insecticide, no fungicide and no ploughing. And while we've done all that, we restored the grassland and soil. So plants, and, and this is quite, quite, quite simple, a lot of this stuff. And again, I'll be talking a lot about, about this. It, it, this is so easy to do by, by almost anyone. Plants are the key to, to fixing our problems, not fertiliser and pesticides. Plants will restore our farm soils and profit. But agriculture, agriculture can be more profitable and regenerate our farms, ecosystems and the planet, but agricultural practices need to function closer to how nature had it originally designed. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you, Colin. Uh, that was awesome, mate. And I, I think one, one takeaway, one real takeaway for, for everybody watching is that not only can you improve uh, the, the function of, of the earth that you're working with, but you can improve the function of your enterprise as well. And um, that, that's definitely a win-win. And just, yeah, just to jump in and sort of talk about the practicality of what Colin's approaching, because it, it is quite different um, to, to conventional methods, and that's what, why he's getting such sort of... I guess people's ears are pricking up all over the world in the sense when they start hearing about it. And the Americans seem to be getting a grasp of these methods a lot more than, than we sort of have picked it up yet. Although you have got, how many farmers in Australia now, Cole, have you got um, pasture cropping? Yeah. There'd be about 2,000 here in Australia, probably, oh, probably close to 3,000 now yeah. in Australia. Yeah, at the very start of that sort of innovation curve. Um, and, and as Colin's saying, and, and as we saw earlier out in the year, I mean, We've just gone through the worst drought in, in how many years over in the um, over in New South Wales there and all over the, the east coast. Um, and what we saw on Colin's property was he, he hadn't had to bring in any dry feed to feed his animals. Um, it was just at the end of that end of that drought, he may have bought like a couple of um, I think he only got a bale or two in to, to but he had all that dry feed buffer on on his um, pasture already. And, and that allowed him and it, and it builds in this resilience into the system. So that's what's really exciting um, for us being, you know, looking at agriculture in a new sort of light. Uh, it doesn't have to be depreciating the ecosystem. It can regenerate the ecosystem while we're maintaining a good bottom line and, and building a healthier uh, enterprise. Um, but now we're just going to jump in and, and sort of talk a little bit more about what's in, uh, involved in the course, a little bit about the, the course index. Um, uh, we're going to get take. Uh, we're going to get Colin to take you through the index. Um, now, this is a very basic index and outline uh, that you can see on screen now of the course. So not. Well, this is the platform anyway. So if 
if anyone's looking to after this webinar go and have a look around and they want to have a bit of a, a further read about um, what we're up to with Colin they can um, jump onto smartsoiledu.com and have a look but where you'll find what we're looking at right now is in the online courses section pasture cropping and then we have the course brief um, so these are the eight chapters that are penciled in at the moment we've added a ninth chapter also on enterprise profitability so as Colin was talking about with these these stacking functions that we can start to integrate into our farm with new yields. Well, I mean, we're able to graze animals more. Obviously, that's going to lead to um, better better animal nutrition, um, and also we're able to start creating more enterprises with the native grass seed um, out the back of that. But uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit on the on the uh, chapters there, Colin. Sort of what we cover because. And to give some, uh, to give everyone a little bit of context, um, we were lucky enough to actually get over to the East Coast. We're based uh, over in WA, um, and at the very start of the year, we've been we did that ground cover you watched at the very beginning of the of the webinar with Colin in May last year, um, and then from that, it built a working relationship. Lindsay's actually from Golgong uh, on the on the East Coast, so we had that. Um, and knew Colin as a, as a child. So um, we're very lucky in that sense, the stars aligned. Um, and we flew over early, just very lucky we got over there early because we, we were there for 10 days or up, up to a week, so, um, seven, 10 days, <coughs> doing filming with Cole. And it was, it, we covered a lot of ground. I mean, we, we got hours and hours of footage and, um, and just went really deep into, into a lot of these subjects. So the mission now in this post section has been making all of that really digestible easy to follow, um, breaking it all down into method, methodology-based sort of practices that people can take and implement on their farm. Um, but yeah, Cole, if you wanted to just talk a little bit on, on, the, uh, on the chapters we went into, and then it would be a really good time now if anyone has questions, just to start jotting them in, um, either in the chat room there, and we can start sorting through. Um, and if you have any questions about the course specifically as well, that'd be great. It's, uh, there's, it's obviously been widely adopted now, this online learning, it's a big transition. And I think agriculture could really benefit from this being a, it's so remote and everyone's sort of doing their own thing. But if we can start coming together on these online platforms and, and sharing information and, and techniques, then it'll be a great thing. Absolutely. I, I'm having trouble reading that, reading the, but I'll work through it, I, I can see it now. If you can make it bigger, it'd be better for everyone. Roger that. Uh, I don't know if I can. I could probably screen snap okay. it and zoom in on it, but I don't think we can do that at the moment. Sorry, Carl. No, that's okay. That's okay. No, I'll, I'll work through that. Well, just go through what uh, 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 what the course is about in each section. There's nine nine chapters in there. The introduction is why. You know, what really and i touched a little bit on on that small talk i did just just a while ago about uh what's gone wrong in agriculture and, and what's gone wrong uh, around the planet and and uh, yeah, agriculture started in mesopotamia in in, in um about well, ten thousand years ago and and that form of agriculture was then adopted by the romans and then and then and in, in, in europe and and that west western agriculture it comes from originally from Mesopotamia, and it failed in Mesopotamia, ten, well, not 10,000 years ago, yeah, five or 6,000 years ago, caused uh, dryland salinity problems, um, silting of rivers and all sorts of major problems. And then that's the form of agriculture we adopted. Why are we surprised when it failed? It failed originally in Mesopotamia. So, so a lot of the, re in that first chapter, we're discussing that a lot. Um, uh, well, not a lot, but I mean the reasons we 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 really need to change, Definitely. Um, and I won't dwell on it too much on that on too much. But then we talk about plants, and plants are important. And, and understand, like pasture cropping is about growing growing uh, crops into living perennial plants. So we need to have an understanding of how plants function, and in particular of, of when the majority of plants you have in a particular paddock or on your property, go into dormancy. And, and often, uh, the, certainly here in Australia, a lot of them go, go into dormancy in the winter, our native grasses do. And that creates a, uh, 
a, a, a time a, 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 to be able to plant crops into that into those perennial grasses when they're in a natural dormancy. Um, but we need to understand about grasslands and how they function and how and how plants grow like um, warm season and cool season grasses and, and, and why they're different. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. Um, also, what else have we got here? Um, livestock. Um, we took, and there's we also go into grazing management quite a lot, uh, not in as much as, as a lot of the grazing management courses uh, do, but we certainly give you an introduction into grazing management and certainly how to graze crops, um, um, the timing of that and, 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 and that, that side of it, um, and certainly how to manage grass, grasslands um, as, as well. Soils uh, are just quite, a, quite detailed on soils and the soil ecosystems. We seem to forget that, that farm, fa farms sh should function as, as ecosystems, but soils also should function as ecosystems, but as an ecosystem. The problem with the industrial agriculture and especially with a lot of pesticides and high rates of fertilizer, um, they stop functioning. They no, they no longer function as an ecosystem, so then we, have, we then it's it's, we, it's required then to put a lot of fertilizer on to even get these crops to grow. Um, it's not lack of nutrients or lack of fertilizer that's the problem. It's a decline a de, a, a, a decline soil ecosystem. So we can restore the soil ecosystem and the farm ecosystem. All this starts to fall into place, and that's really what this is all about. Uh, uh, pasture cropping is as much about restoring farms and, and, and soils as it is about growing a crop. The cropping side of it is, is, is part of how we fix it, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, the people that are very successful with pasture cropping are the ones that focus on the grassland and focus on restoring the grasslands and soil. Then it really works well for them. Um, what else have we got here? Um, then obviously we go into quite detailed uh, I think, uh, uh, stuff on pasture cropping itself. How 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 we we uh, uh, even start? Where do we start from? Um, how we, we might start with a either a very weedy uh, uh, paddock, um, and certainly when we first start to transition, what we're doing is often just changing the herbicides still. Not, not going cold turkey or, or, uh, with organic pasture cropping, but, but then transitioning to it, changing fertilizer and using more selective, I'm uh, sorry, herbicides, and then transitioning slowly, because we don't want to go broke while, while, while we're creating the changes. Um, so learn how to do that. Then, um, like on the property here, I, I saw a lot of, I'm, I'm not, not uh, certified organic, but we sow a lot of crops now without herbicide and use a lot of biological fertilizers. I, I could do it, I could be an organic producer, I guess. Uh, I still want to keep as many options uh, for me as possible, so I, I haven't worried about going organic. But there there are a lot of people that do want to, want to do that, so, and we'll, we'll discuss organic pasture cropping as well. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, we will also uh, uh, touch on uh, multi-species crops and how we can use combinations of plants to fix particular problems either on our properties and especially to fix soil, soil, com soil compaction issues, um, nutrient cycling, uh, building carbon, uh, uh, holding, uh, improving water holding capacity, all of that stuff we can do with plants and different combinations of plants. Um, so, where are we now? Um, the last two chapters, one, one is on, is on, on organic uh, pasture cropping. We'll be talking about different ways we can do this without using herbicides. And some of that is by different, using different types of machinery, um, but also different, different um, uh, obviously cha changing any, any fertilizers to organic fertilizers. But, also moving it to a point where we don't necessarily need fertilizer at all. 
Um, and even though I've spoken about transitioning before, the, the last chapter is on transitioning and how we actually can do this. How, how do we transition from where we are now to a method of agriculture that continually regenerates our farms? We, uh, which it's just been accepted that agriculture will and does um, dis uh, uh, destroy our farms. We went out from soil erosion, um, loss of, of perennial species, the loss of, of soil structure all, and, and ecosystems, it's just been accepted and that's not good enough. We, we certainly, we need, we need agriculture to regenerate our farms and we certainly can, that, that isn't a problem. We can use agriculture and use, use these methods to fix our farms. Colo, I, um, uh, okay. I just have a point there to add if that's okay. Um, yeah. within, the, within the transitioning phase, you know, uh, we want to make you aware that uh, our goal is to offer as much support as possible ongoing as you're making that transition. And um, Colin and the team, uh, we've, we've spoken about what's the best way that we can support these guys as they go through that transitioning phase. We determined initially that uh, the best way to do that, we're going to hold four annual webinars, very similar to what we're doing now for anyone who has purchased the course. You get access to these webinars in which a similar uh, template to what we're doing now, you can ask Colin things related to your enterprise um, that are going to help you make that transition. What we're also working on is, is a consultation, online consultation from Colin ongoing. Um, and, and that will be obviously at a, a, a set fee, but we're still working on that. Um, we're still developing that side of things. Um, that's a, a, a good time for us to move on now, Colin, if you're, if you're happy, um, to some questions. We've got a few questions that have, have come through. So, uh, and, and thank you to the attendees as well. I've got a few people chiming in. So we've got uh, Michael from New South Wales, Hunter Valley, Cobram, uh, Victoria, Adam, Central Victoria, Kaula, New South Wales, North Otago, New, Ze New Zealand, Beauty. Welcome. Hello. Welcome, welcome. All that. So Victoria, no, that's wrong. Um, Kahuna, Northern Victoria, yeah, nice. Beauty. Let's go to a question. All right, should we fire off the first question? So from John um, Caruthers, how suitable do you think this course is for a small scale lifestyle type property where the landowner is at ground floor in terms of agriculture, but is committed to rehabilitating the landscape back into a productive capacity? Yeah. Good question. Okay. I, I get a lot of uh, requests from uh, people that are new to agriculture um, on all those to uh, big properties to small properties. And, and almost always, like, I find a lot of people that are new to agriculture actually make very good farmers because they're open-minded and, and they're really wanting to, to do things differently. They can see the problems in, in agriculture where some people that have been involved in agriculture all their lives often can't, can't see it because they're too close to it. Um, and yeah, I, I do a lot of on farm consulting to, to people on to small properties. Um, so yeah, the, the, the course is, is certainly suitable to any form of agriculture. We're not talking about big scale stuff necessarily. Um, and it's all about really about growing plants and, 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 and plant diversity really. Yeah. Um, and we can do that in many different ways. That's it. If you've got soil, then, then this is definitely applicable. I'll put grow on plants. Okay, next question. Um, thank you, Craig Pensini uh, from Mundaring. Yep, the, love the Colin uh, presentation by Cole. We'd love to access a copy. So um, that's a good time to bring up YouTube, uh, Smart Soil AU. We have a, a YouTube channel. We've done a few ground covers and, and sort of things. Um, in the past on different regenerative farmers in the space. Cole, uh, Cole was one of them. We interviewed the Haggerty's up in Moller and WA up there and a couple of other crew that are really pushing the boundaries in, in ag. So if you go over to YouTube, we'll have this webinar uploaded in the coming weeks. Um, so you'll be able to touch on it again and, and cover any points that we, um, that you want to freshen up on. Uh, it's pretty much the same. Beauty. And John again, yeah, is, it a, is this course a one size fits all or can it be customised depending on the participant situation? Is there any interactive components, e.g. with a mentor or instructor? Occasional video chat. Yeah, nice. So I think Lynn sort of answered that question before. We will have built-in support 
and depending on your requirements, we can also add in more support if, if that's if that's required. We want this is a this is the start of a journey, you know, and that's um, spoke to Dr. Mary Cole the other day, who's a um, mycologist from Melbourne, and she said that you know if if these people are going to change and it, it really they really have to know that this is stepping onto a, into a new journey and a, um, that is is more fulfilling, I guess, because you you are regenerating the land you're on um, and leaving a legacy. Beautiful. Uh, Jamie Wright from New South Wales, watching from Northern Tablelands. Beautiful. Very keen to learn about multi-species planting into existing pastures and increasing species diversity. Beautiful. Watch this space. Oh, there we go. We've got Kira Lee from Galgong, New South Wales. I have a small 250-acre cattle property. Very interested in this method, but I'm wondering what sort of equipment is needed, please. I don't even own a tractor at the moment. Good question. Okay. A few different ways around that, and, and you have to weigh up uh, uh, whether it is uh, practical to, to own machinery on small areas. However, there's usually uh, people that, that can contract uh, for you. Uh, the main thing you need to, uh, that, that contractor needs to know is what you're trying to achieve. Um, and they'll often try to talk you into using the wrong sort of herbicide or, 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 or call you a, a lunatic for doing strange things um, <laughs> but there are often often uh, I, there's often people around that, that, that do that do contract uh, sewing well uh, Kira Lee is, is from Golgon Cole so we'll send her around to yours to grab any machinery she needs <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> next uh, next question from Bryce Gibbs uh, thanks Colin and all the lads from SmartSoft for arranging this webinar awesome presentation uh, thank you Bryce um, very excited about upcoming courses, especially with the multi-species pasture cropping, holistic management, and soil ecosystem function. Uh, very in-depth and glad to see Quorum Sensing in there also. So, um, you know, cool Bryce, thank you so much. Um, these ideas, the ideas of Quorum Sensing, uh, you know, the ideas of looking at farming on a deeper level, it's growing, it's expanding um, the world over. So we're, we're pumped about it as well. Next question from uh, Jody. Hey, you want to read that out there? Yeah, mate. Interested in how this system works on an irrigation dairy farm. Yeah. Uh, and I don't okay. know where yeah. Jody is. Yep. Let us know, Jody. Right. Yeah. You want me to answer that one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It'll work on. It'll work on any any farm dairy, but irrigation makes it makes it easier. Um, it and and dairies dairies are, are an interesting one. Uh, there, as, as we're aware, dairy farmers in Australia here are, are going broke left, right and centre. Often it's related to the extremely high inputs. Um, that, that, um, and, and it's almost the same type of problem as what's gone wrong with industrial agriculture. Because soils get that degraded um, and, and the, the, the necessity then to put on a whole heap of fertiliser, I mean extremely high fertiliser rates and pesticide rates on dairy farms. To be able to get enough production off it to justify the cost of all those fertilizers, so we need to gradually transition off a lot of those high inputs, not necessarily all of them, to then create more profit. Um, and, and we certainly can. Um, and some of it is, is about just simply often changing, changing the herbicide. Um, and, and I haven't mentioned it today, but Roundup is one of our biggest problems that we've got. And okay, we, we know we've got problems from a human health point of view, but Roundup just kills everything. We don't want to kill everything. We want to keep some things alive. So Roundup is, is, a, is, a, is a serious problem in that sense. It, it will not never let our farms regenerate. Um, Cole, so. I've got something to, to, to add there. Um, I mean, do you, if we're putting those inputs on a dairy farm, um, what do you think the knock-on effects are of, of animals grazing these types of things? like? Roundup, of course. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know whether there's any work done on Roundup, but certainly urea and high rates of, like of nitrates in milk is a is a human health problem. Mm. Um, not only that, uh, it's, it, it, it's it's a cow health problem. A lot of the problems on dairy farms are, are, are a lot of the costs are, are veterinary costs, and they're mostly metabolic diseases caused by the types of pastures. Okay, we, we're trying to produce a, a lot of milk off them, a, a maximum production of milk, but 
That's right. It's a huge expense, a, 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 a huge cost in relation to, to the health of the animals. So it's just need to, we need to be well aware of that and, and we can start to transition or, or move away. I've actually, I know a fellow that's he's pasture cropping, a dairy farm farmer in Northern Victoria, um, that's doing a wonderful job and he gets virtually no metabolic diseases out at all. Um, and he's going oh, to all this as well. As well, something that blew me away when, when we were out on farm with you there, that you said about the quality of wool um, was better since you started pasture cropping. And also you were having to, uh, what, what would you call it, um, treat your, give them the drenches, you're drenching your sheep a lot, well, a, yeah. a lot less yeah. as well. So. Yeah, the animals are certainly a lot healthier. There's no doubt about that. It, it, and it's related to, but well, here on this, this property, we haven't used fertiliser on here for 40 years. No, no, superphosphate, like phosphorus fertiliser for 40 years. But the pastures just get better and better, not get worse and worse. There's a lot of things said about the need for, for fertilisers and pesticides that just simply aren't true yeah. uh, in, in, in a practical sense. So, but, but I've got off track there a bit. Uh, but a lot of it's related to that the, the animals are healthier here because we're not using all those high inputs. It's not extremely high nitrates uh, now that they're eating. Um, yeah, everything everything can be a lot healthier and better. And then it, then it adds up to more profit. Mm. Um, like I'm far more profitable here now than, than we ever were uh, on, uh, on property here. A lot of that's related to less cost as well. Uh, absolutely, and, and I can attest to that. I grew up in uh, Golgong where, where Colin farms. In fact, my father planted uh, many, many trees on Colin's property. Um, and um, growing up in that area, I always remember as a kid, it was a beautiful, a stunning place. Uh, the grasslands were healthy, but as I, as I got older and as I kept returning back home, it seemed as though I was returning to Mars at times. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was very dry and arid and desolate. Now we, we went out to, you know, that was upsetting. It's upsetting for anyone to see the, the, the earth in that state. I, I, we went out to Collins to film this course. And it, although amidst the drought, his pastures were not booming, they were living. They were living pastures where everything else was dead. And to us, that really sort of put the nail in the coffin. You know, we can, we can see firsthand the effects of, that these practices are, are, are having. Um, so we've got a, a couple more questions coming through. Um, great question from John uh, Carruthers again. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, David. You're welcome, mate. Thanks for your questions. Um, over what period do you recommend undertaking the course or is it best done self-paced? Um, that's, that's great. Most, well, everyone learns differently. Um, we've tried to integrate as much sort of different um, learning mechanisms as possible. So different mediums, animation, video, text, to sort of cater for all learning types. But it is very much a self-paced course. So go as you learn. You'll always have access to the resources. Your login will be there. You can go back, log in, even do the course again if you want. Um, view any resources that you need. And um, yeah, so that's, that's that one. Definitely self-paced. But we estimate it'll be about two to three weeks if you were to really, you know, get dig in, in, dig in. Yeah. Uh, next one's for Cole. Uh, Colin, do you think it's possible to successfully undertake pasture cropping techniques without livestock? Uh, here in WA wheat belt, especially uh, the 400 to 300 millimetre rainfall zones, we have many large cropping enterprises who don't have livestock. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, um, yes, you can. You can pasture crop without livestock. Um, uh, it, it, it works a lot better with livestock. Um, if, if you end up with grass really high and plant into grass that's really high, I, as in uh, there's a few things that happen. Um, the, the crop gets shaded uh, and also there's often, there sometimes can be a nitrogen drawdown problem uh, with a lot of e e excessive dry material, just like in a wheat stubble. But, so, and the animals consume that and turn it into, into plant available nutrients, as in manure. Um, but you can uh, still uh, slash and, and mow uh, those grasses and plant in, into them. Um, the livestock add a lot of profit to the, to the enterprise as, as well. But it can be done um, and, and, uh, and, and, and you can start the transition into it by, a, anyway. 
uh, without the animals, but I always recommend animals. Beautiful. And Craig's, Craig's up in uh, Tom Price there. Oh, no, that's Bryce. Um, but I believe he might have reached out on LinkedIn the other day and, and said something. Um, but Chila, Chila Station, I think it was, is, is a mob that's, um, they're partially cropping up in the Pilbara region. So it could be interesting to have a look at. Yep. Uh, all right. So Jody, the with the dairy question, was in Kahuna, Northern Victoria. Thanks again. Um, great comment from Amanda. Well, if you have healthy, balanced soils, you'll have more nutrient-dense plants, which will only have beneficial outcomes for animals and humans alike. Amen, sister. Yep. Um, how do you handle seed issues in sheep, lambs with longer grass heights? Also, how to understand when you're at the point when you don't need fertilizer anymore? That was from Ra. Okay. That question. Good yep. question. <clears throat> I'll answer both those. Um, the um, uh, what happened here as well, I'll just backtrack. People assume that native grasses na native, uh, are, are just full of seeds and, and awns and, and horrible things. Many of the, the, the seeds that contaminate wool and, and get into sheep are often introduced ones. They're not native. Like barley grass, for example, is, is, in, is introduced. Vulpia or silver grass is introduced, and they're two of the main problems that, that we have have with with grass seed. They're, they're not native at all. Now, some of the native species are like spear grass, um, uh, three prong grass like Aristida. They are, but what I found here, as the grassland started to uh, uh, return, it it it, uh, um, it it came back almost like in an order that, that well ecologically things happen this way. They, the colonising species come in first, which often are those awn species, um, and then it moves to, to better quality species. Now, uh, here with, with uh, our wool, uh, wool is a great way to monitor um, uh, how your pastures are going, because we test wool now. There's virtually no seed in it. Our, our, our vegetable matter in our wool is, is under half percent, which is extremely low. And our grasslands here, here, well, our pastures here are 80% native grasses and 60 species of native, natives in them. Virtually no more contamination at all. Um, and also, <clears throat> in regard to that, the best wool in the world is growing in, in the tablelands, uh, in, in, in the high country, and it's all native. Uh, so, like the super fine wools. Uh, uh, so, we don't need to worry too much about that. But, um, and as we start to transition into it, we can manage manage that as well with our animals and how we graze it as well. What about the, um, at what point do you realise you don't need fertiliser anymore? What, when does that light bulb um, come off? <clears throat> now, in regard to sowing the crops, what I did here, like, I've reduced fertiliser by 70% with the crops. And, and now no, I don't use fertiliser on the pastures. Uh, so, but with the crops, what I did was, um, uh, over time, I just gradually reduced the amount I was putting in with the crop, but I did a trial strip for the paddock and I, I reduced it and just see whether there was any difference in, in, the, in the yield or, or the look of the crop. And if there wasn't, well, it just next year reduced the rate over the whole property. A couple of years later, do another trial strip and I gradually reduced it down. So that's how we can transition. Uh, with the fertiliser on pastures here, it, there was no transition because, as I said very quickly in the talk there, we were burnt out in the fire. I couldn't afford the superphosphate, the, the phosphorus fertiliser mm. anyway, so I just went cold turkey, which is not what I would recommend now. Um, so, you, again, you, you transition out of, uh, out of the, the uh, uh, gradually reduced fertiliser over time. Then soil starts cycling. Um, it's about getting nutrient, sorry, not soils, nutrients start cycling in soils and then nutrients start to become available. There's no doubt about that. We've got good data and good proof on that uh, with, uh, with, with a lot of the, 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 the um, scientific papers that have been done here, which we could make available also in, in this course. So I know you just thought of that. Fantastic. And we do um, have resources. Some of those scientific papers we could definitely uh, get sent out to people. Bloody oath. I think that's... Yeah, and there is a lot of supporting evidence from all the trials. Colin's actually on one of the most researched farms in Australia. Um, he's had a lot of work done out there. So that's the great thing about this is that it, we do have the data there to back it up and we'll make that available within the course. So 
Um, a couple of questions, uh, and then we better start wrapping things up, Cole. I know you're shearing yep. at the moment, so you're a busy man. Um, Steph, no, no, finish that. Are oh, you done? Finish that yeah. for running today. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. All right, Stephanie, does this course cover types of equipment and machinery required? Uh, we sort of touched on that one before, but I don't know if you wanted to this pretty easy one. Yep. Yep. What, what, what's that again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Does, this, does the course cover types of equipment, machinery, slash re machinery required? Oh, yes. Yeah, we cover a lot, a lot of machine, different types of machinery um, and, and, how, and converting existing machinery. Like, not everyone can spend $400,000 on a machine, but I can't, just don't know how anyone can justify it. But, so, th there's, there's a lot of really good examples of, of, of what people have done in converting just old machinery that's been lying around behind sheds, like converting chisel plows um, at very, very low cost, converting existing uh, seed drills. Um, so yeah, it's a, there's a lot of information on that, um, and, and and different types of yeah, yeah quite a lot on the show. That's it, and we did we did actually a, a section on and some of the retrofits that you've um the changes you've made, simple changes you've made to your um, seeding equipment as well, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. Uh, good yeah. question from Simon Incasel. Um, this will be the second last question, and then there's one more from Bryce after this, right? Uh, is the soil key system a way to start the pasture cropping system? I don't know much about the system. If you had any info on that, it would be great. Pros and cons. Yep, we, the soil key um, is, a, is a really interesting uh, machine and, and can be used for pasture cropping, especially, especially organic pasture cropping. Um, and uh, yes, good machine. There's another way of doing that, a very similar thing, but with a lot lower cost as well. Uh, and that can be done with something like Yeoman's uh, plow with a seed drill on it. And we talk about that as well, of how, how we can do this totally organically into green, uh, into a, say, a green growing pasture, which, which you normally would, you certainly wouldn't, wouldn't do it and do um, without a herbicide, but we can do that. So the soil key can be a, a very useful machine. But again, like you say, not everyone has that 100, 150k just lying around to chuck it at, um, at a soil key renovator. So, um, yes. great, great answer. All right, Bryce Gibbs, our last question. Good job, mate. It sounds like a goodie too. You ready, Cole? Colin, <laughs> what kind of seeding rig do you run on your property? Do you run a disc seeder in your pasture cropping? And how do you manage trash management and hair pinning in the native tussock grasses? Do you inoculate seed with liquid vermicast, compost extract, and what else do you do, to, or what else do you add down the tube? We might be all day asked, answering that question. <laughs> um, do you want to unpack it into a couple? Or? <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Um, what I use here, it's a, uh, I, I just uh, didn't want to spend $100,000 on a machine. I started with an old Cronache, uh, and, and, and uh, just and they had six inch spacings, it took half the tines off, tighten up the springs and put knife points on it, the way I went, which can work. Uh, but what I, what I uh, uh, then got into, there was an old international scarifier sitting around here, actually it used to belong to my father. So I modified that, used the existing tines on that, put knife points on them and put an air cart behind it. Um, and, in, and then it made it wider. And it's got everything bolted on that thing. Um, <laughs> I put press wheels behind it. I put uh, uh, disc openers in front of it. Uh, and so it, it'll handle it on. And then I put, also put a, an extra seed box on there for, for sowing uh, small seeds in a multi-species mix. So I can do everything in one pass with that thing. Um, and it's just a, a converted uh, international scarifier. Um, and, and when we, you were filming here, you took some, you did some filming on that machine, so it'll be it, it's a fair bit of information on that machine. Yeah, we'll be able to display that. One thing you missed there, Cole, was uh, do you inoculate seed with liquid vermicast compost extract? Yep. Okay. Uh, on that existing machine, I also put a liquid injection uh, uh, tank on it, and so I was I was actually using uh, compost teas, making compost teas. And, and I have also used uh, um, a, a, a liquid like worm, worm juice, like in, that was from, from Nutrisoil in Victoria, very good product. Um, and um, both of those, any worm products are, are, are really good. Um, 
the, the compost tea can be good to transition. What I actually found though was the best microbial food on the planet is uh, worm leach, uh, no, sorry, actually, uh, is plant exudates, uh, plant root exudates. Uh, the sugars that get shooted into the soil are uh, mother nature's uh, uh, microbial food. So what we're doing, what, what the advantages we get by, by planting multi-species uh, crops is, is feeding microbes. So I, I did the full circle in a lot of this. I tried all of those things and all those products and there's nothing wrong, not being critical of any of those products, but went back to growing just more plants. Um, as but, fast uh, as possible. Fantastic. That plants will save our farms and profits, aren't they, mate? <laughs> All day. <laughs> uh, just think one thing we didn't answer there was the uh, the disc seeder and how do we manage yep. the trash management hair pinning with the yep. Great question. Great question. Um, now, I started with knife points here. Um, uh, and the reason I started with knife points, this, this, uh, the, the soil on this farm was like concrete. And I, I reasoned at the time that, that a disc was not going to get good result, good crop result. And, and uh, because I wanted some, some tilth or some loose soil underneath the, the seed. So I went with knife points and, and on foot spacings, 30 centimetre spacings, and, and got really good results with it and then stayed with that. On good, when our soil structure improves, we can move to discs, but if we, if we have discs too early, we'll, we're, our, often our crop results will be disappointing. Our soils need to be ready for discs. Um, the other advantage is, is cost. Like disc planters are bloody expensive. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and, but, but the tine planters can be are, are, are a lot more cost effective. Um, so I'm not being critical of discs at all, but just be a bit careful about how fast you move into them, that's all. Awesome. Fantastic. We're gonna, um, we're gonna move to, to wrap this up, guys. We've gone a little bit over time. Um, so we just wanted to give you some, some key information on the course um, and, and what it involves. Prior to doing that, uh, we want to offer all the attendees that have come to this webinar today 15% uh, off uh, pre-sale pre for the course, okay? So if you would like 15% off pre-sale on the course, which is released mid-June, um, what I want you to do is put your email down in the comments section and we'll get an email sent out to you with the offer code. Okay, so if you want 15% off, please just pop your email down there in the comments section uh, and we'll get a, an offer code sent out to you. You'll then be able to go onto our platform and, and pre-purchase that course um, with, with a discount applied. Uh, again, just key things to understand, the course is self-paced, you can take your time. Uh, it's priced at 349 US dollars. Uh, there's nine modules involved and as I said just earlier, we're looking at a mid-June release. We're still working very, very hard on the back end to get everything, uh, to get everything ready. Uh, if, if you guys uh, want to take some time out to, to go onto our, our Smart Soul YouTube channel, uh, please subscribe uh, and share the stories of what we're doing. Um, it really helps our mission in getting these sorts of practices out there and, and having people look at farming in a holistic manner. Um, so uh, if you can help us push that message, that, that, that will be greatly appreciated.